let's talk about multi-objective optimization here. Um, let me share my screen. And uh, multi-objective optimization is, um, uh, I hope it's not too abstract to, to understand here, but let's, um, let's actually just come over here and I'll just draw some things to help us understand it. <clears throat> Okay, so we're gonna uh, talk here for a minute about multi-objective optimization. So up to this point, we've talked about optimization with only a single objective. Meaning, we you know we have some some uh, some inputs. Uh, so we have inputs coming into a model or a function, and then the output of that is what we call the objective. But um, let's let's take an example. In fact, uh, 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 Nolan, we're going to just pick on your research here for a minute and use yours as an, exam as an example. Let's say, so for example, what Nolan's trying to do is optimize the sh shape of a, a uh, of an axisymmetric geometry. And there's two things we, we care about that. And this axisymmetric geometry is at supersonic speed. So there's two things we care about. Uh, we care about the the amount of drag uh, that it um, that it produces, and number two, we care about the noise on the ground. We call that PLDB. Okay, so decibels, the perceived level of noise on the ground. So he can run a simulation uh, given a specific geometry and outcome two variables, you know, or outcome two results: the amount of drag that is produced and the noise on the ground. And what we'd under what we'd like to understand is the trade-off between these two. You know, if if this thing is optimized to minimize drag, how much noise does that produce? Or if it was optimized to minimize noise, how much drag does that produce? So what we're trying to understand is kind of the trade-off between the two. So let's just plot what that might look like over here. So if on on one axis we had drag, and on the other axis we had noise or the PLDB. Um, let's look at the case where we've minimized drag. Okay, so let's say that we had we just did single objective optimization. We minimized this thing for drag. Then we would get a point on here. Let's say uh, you know this is the amount of drag that it creates, but it creates uh, quite a bit of noise at least on this scale, right? Or we could optimize this thing for noise and uh, minimize the noise, but uh, most likely there's gonna be a trade-off. And so, you know, we might be able to get the noise down to this level, but we're gonna pay a drag penalty for that, right? So these are two cases that we could get from single objective optimization. We could look at these two cases, either optimize for noise or optimize for drag. We get these two data points out. Um, and you know we could then estimate, I guess, by drawing a straight line between those, that there's there's probably solutions in here that we could get, uh, you know, that's kind of a trade-off between drag and noise, and so that the you know the aircraft designer is going to have to make a decision of how much drag they're willing to give up or how much noise they're going to give up, you know, to minimize drag. So, um, but we don't really know what that looks like without running some more optimization cases. So we can actually fill out this this uh, um, what this looks like as we transition between the two. Um, and that uh, and, and the actual transition, let's just say it, it actually looks like this. What if there's a family of cases where we could we could find out that that there are solutions all in here? And and of course there's an infinite number of solutions, right? So so there's an, an infinite number of combinations of geometries out here that produce uh, different amounts of noise and drag, right? So there's there's tons of solutions out here, but what we wanna know is what are the, the family of solutions that create this curve of minimum noise and drag trade-off, you know, if we could minimize. And so um, uh, this, this uh, curve right here is called the Pareto front. And that's uh, named after somebody named Pareto uh, who developed it apparently. Um, anyway, Pareto front with a capital P because it's a name. So we wanna find the Pareto front. And basically 
the, the Pareto front is made up of all of the cases. If, if we could run all of the cases that, uh, you know, an infinite number of, of cases uh, that um, are possible here, then like I said, we, could, we would come up with a very dense uh, set of cases here, right? So we'd have a whole bunch of, of uh, solutions on here. And basically what we wanna do is put a rubber band around those and look at the, the this curvature here between noise and drag, you know, of all the solutions that are out there that are possible, what would that rubber band line look like if we could rubber band those solutions along the bottom uh, corner there? So, um, so the way we do that is, is uh, well, there, there are different ways of handling, but what, what we're gonna go over today is, um, is a way to handle, this is called multi-objective optimization. We have more than one objective, We'd like to understand uh, the trade-off between these two objectives. We know what the result is if we if we only look at one objective or the other. You know, we can get those two solutions there. But what's the trade-off between? What's the family of solutions that create this Pareto front between the two? So let me just show an example of how we might approach that. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is um, in my uh, in my function, I'm actually going to have two things. One of these is I'm going to call drag, and one of them I'm going to call um, um, uh, noise. Okay, just for our, for our example here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this result here that we looked at earlier, um, and I'm going to call that the drag. And uh, and then I'm going to use the sphere function. These are just functions, you know, that are that are different, and that's called my noise. Okay. So I have two things that my function is producing now, a, a drag and a noise for any given set of X and Y values. <clears throat> and of course, I could optimize just on drag and return drag down here, or I could just optimize on noise and return noise down here. But instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use both of these. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna say, we're going to look at both the drag and the noise, and I'm going to use this uh, this linear mixing function between the two. <clears throat> so I'm going to set a gamma value. Um, when gamma is zero, then this result will return zero times drag plus one minus gamma times noise. So when, when gamma is zero, I'm just going to return exactly what the noise is. Let me turn this off for a second. So the result here is gonna be equal to whatever the noise said. When gamma is one, if I put in a one for gamma, then it will return what the drag is and not what the noise is. That's what the result will be set to, okay? And then I could choose a number between zero and one and basically do a linear combination of these two things where I'm, I'm kind of incrementing up drag and, and decrementing the, the influence of noise so I'm playing with the influence of the drag and the noise on, on what the actual result is, okay? And so that then gives me a single objective down here that I can be, um, th that I'm actually optimizing for, okay? But I can now look at the trade-off between these two. So let me run, let's just start at zero and we're gonna increment up here. So, so I'm gonna uh, say we start at zero and I'm gonna run this using just the BFGS method. And uh, it took only two iterations, 15 calls, and it said, this is your solution right here. And um, actually, what I wanna know is uh, the, let's see. Um, actually, I take it back. I'm gonna need to turn on this print statement here because I want to have the information in a certain Order. Okay, so I'm going to print out every call. I'm going to print out gamma, x, y, and the result. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so let's see. Let's see. Hold on. I've got to print out a little bit more than just result. I've got to print out what the amount of drag is the amount of noises and what the actual result is. There we go, that's what I need to know. Okay, so let me rerun this again. And uh, okay, for every iteration, let's spit that out. And I'm just gonna grab this last one and assume that that's the final solution. 
I'm going to drop it in a text file. Let's grab a text file over here. Okay, so there's my, my, for gamma equals zero, this is what it came up with the optimization. And we're gonna look at this in just a minute in Excel. But uh, now let's say gamma equals 0.1. And uh, maybe I'll speed this up. I'm gonna go in increments of 0.2 so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on here. So I'll grab, there's for 0.2. So, I'm, so this one is using, uh, Let's see, point two is using 20% drag and 80% noise to optimize the, when it was zero, it was using all of just noise to optimize. I'm gonna say point four and rerun the optimization. Here's my solution here. And then point six. Of course, uh, point five would be that I'm weighting e each of them equally because I'm doing this in increments of uh, 0.2, we're skipping over 0.5, but you can see what's happening here. Okay, so here's 0.8. And then finally, we'll put in 1.0. Okay. So now I'm going to take these and uh, drop them into Excel. And uh, let's see. So this was gamma. Uh, then we had uh, X, Y, uh, the drag, the noise, and the, the um, objective function value. OK. OK, so, um, so now I can actually just plot this trade-off between drag and noise. Let's insert. Uh, okay, so this is our trade-off between drag and noise. Now, <clears throat> this is a little bit, <clears throat> maybe not a very good example um, because they both go to zero in their in their local or th their own optima. You know, we knew that the minimum of this sphere function, which I'm using for the noise, is really uh, x and y are both zero, and that returns zero. And then, of course, uh, the drag function, the minimum there is that uh, x is five and y is two. And that returns zero. Okay, so, but anyway, we get the the shape that we would expect here. So, um, so on the x-axis we have drag. So drag, if I minimize drag all by itself, I can get it down to zero. Of course, that's not physically possible, but uh, what I've done here, just because we're using this function, it is zero. But um, anyway, so the minimum of drag is zero, but that returns a noise on the y-axis of uh, this is almost thirty, right? Uh, Sorry, I'm, I should. This is the one down here. That's what I'm looking at. So <clears throat> zero and thirty, and then if I were to minimize noise, uh, I can get that down to zero, but the drag is going to be forty-one, right? And then I can look at this trade-off between the two, and this is basically that Pareto front, um, you know, between the two. And I could fill in more points here, you know, uh, uh, compute more points in here at smaller increments to fill out this Pareto front. And then I could evaluate this trade-off. And basically, we would expect these solutions, that this Pareto front to be the collection of, of minimum solutions that we could ever achieve, uh, you know, looking at drag and noise. You know, the, this is the collection of points. This is that Pareto front of minimum solutions we can ever get to. What we really are trying to get to is a point down here, right, where we've minimized both drag and noise. And, this is as close as we can get. Are these points right along this Pareto front? Um, that's as close as we can get to that uh, minimum point there. So what do you guys think? Got a question in the chat. Never mind, we're good there. So Dr. Hunsaker, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, with this Pareto front thing, if we were like on this, on this chart here, if we were instead, instead of doing this gamma approach, if we were to like pick one of these intermediate values of PLDB and put that as a constraint and say, I want my PLDB to be this, now minimize drag. Mm -hmm. 
Would that give us the same point in the design space as this gamma approach? Let's try it, shall we? Okay, yeah, I'm curious. Okay, so um, so we want to choose, uh, let's just choose one of these intermediate points. I mean, this is really close to 20. Um, so you're gonna have to walk me through how to add a constraint here. I just don't know it off the top of my head. So, so we'd have constraints equals something like this. Well, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with doing this in site by dot optimize. Okay. See. Or we can do it in optics. Either one is fine. Uh, not that I'm more, I'm, I don't think I'm more familiar with it in optics, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think this is a great thing to try. And actually, how about this? Let's, um, let's, uh, let me look at this while you guys are working on something here. Okay. And, and you can look at this too, Corey, while you're, um, while we're working on this next step. But basically for this next exercise, what I'd like you to do is each of you choose two of these functions. Now you've already coded up one of them. Choose one other function now that you're gonna add to your, uh, your fitness function here, your, your uh, objective function. And just the way that I've done, you know, call this result one, result two or whatever, do a mixing between the two and plot a Pareto front between those two solutions of, you know, of optimal solutions between the two. Okay. So why don't you guys take a crack at that? Let's take about uh, 10 minutes and work through that. And um, I'll work on this constraint question. And Corey, you can work on the constraint question as well. <clears throat> right. Well, I guess it's the same as, uh, it's basically the same as optics inside by dot optimize. You give it a dictionary and then you just tell it. Are we are you using SLSQP? Um, I had it on BFGS, but we can switch around. All right. I mean, all of them should work pretty well with any of these because these are, you know, these are really well behaved design spaces. So uh -huh. see, so, yeah, I think we would just say type is a, is a quality and then fun. The equality means it needs to equal zero. Okay. So is so it you type, have, is it type colon? Uh type type is in type is in quotes. Okay, because this is a dictionary. Like that? Yeah, like that. And then okay. we need to define another function that would be whatever our noise function is minus our desired noise level. Okay. So I'm just going to call it noise. Uh, is that in? No, it's just not in quotes and just be uh, noise. Okay. And then you just define that up above. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just return return uh, that um, minus, we want to look at one case over here, right? So um, how about this number there? Does that seem right, what I'm doing? Yeah, that looks right to me. Okay. And I'm going to return drag up here. And then we want an equality of noise. And then uh, that needs to I think, that, I think that's all we need because we we don't have a Jacobi and we don't have extra args. So you, I think that's all that needs to be in that dictionary. But don't and that we need needs to, to be. Don't we need to tell it what it needs to equal? We just want it to equal to zero because we're calling an equality constraint, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it's it's going to make it be zero. Oh, and we need is. that in. Some... Uh huh. That's that's how the equality constraint is defined. It's simply that that oh, okay. function needs to be zero. 
Um, except, okay. so where you define your constraint, that needs to be in curly braces. Okay. Of bracket. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah, and then in sp.minimize, you have to add constraints equals constraints oh. there. All right, I lost your mic for a second. So in sp.minimize, you need to add a constraint. Constraints is equals constraint. Like that? Yeah, I okay. think that's the way to do it. Okay. Let's see what happens. And then we, we need to change method to SLSQP. Right. Yeah, SLSQP and returning drag. Um, I'm going to print the drag and the noise, but that doesn't really matter. I'm not using anything there. So that should be fine. You should be good. Okay. All right. Let's run this, see what happens. Oops. Not return equals. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay, there you go. This is what it comes up with. So it's the difference between those two. I'm not, I don't have a good enough resolution to see what you're seeing. Okay. I see. There we go. Hmm. So it's, it's matching out to. Oops. Matching out to single precision at least. Yeah. Which is probably based off of our gradients or, or convergence or something, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, but you're right. This is another way to handle it. So you can put a constraint on one and, and uh, basically what we're then doing is optimizing in a column here, right? We're saying we're mm -hmm. going to constrain one of these axes to some value. So let's say we constrain this to 20. And so we're going to allow the other one to optimize vertically, you know, how far can it get, uh, how far can it get down you know, the, the value of the other axis while holding that at 20. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm just, I mean, I'm, I've done very, very little with, I'm not very familiar with Pareto fronts, but I'm not convinced that the two approaches here are equivalent. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced they would give you the same Pareto front, but I could be wrong. They may not. I don't, I guess I can't prove it. Um, Um, I don't see why they would not, though, at, um, you know, at, at first glance here. Yeah. Um, I'd have to think of a case where they're specifically not, you know, it's very possible that they're not always going to give you the same thing. But I, there's, I can't think of a case right now that's obvious where, where it wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just seems like two different problems to me. One, one problem, you're optimizing one variable given a const or you're optimizing one result given a constraint on the other result. The other problem, you're optimizing a linear combination of the two results. So I, I but I don't know. I wonder if you're, uh, if you're dragging your noise functions were less well behaved yeah if you'd get differences yeah but then again see what we've done is we've basically created a new design space right that's a mix between these these two uh functions well i guess i don't have good images for them but you know so mm -hmm. we have one design space that looks like this one we have another design space like this and we've basically um created a third design space that's a linear combination of those and it looks uh, you know, whatever value we have for gamma, um, we've created a, a new design space now that's a linear combination of the other two. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So perhaps that linear combination could create um, local minima, uh, you know, local unwanted minima. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess that's possible that with a combination of these two design spaces could create local minima. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, again, I can't think of a, you know, it, it, we'd have to like come up with an example case, I think, to prove it. But I, I think it's possible that this would not yeah. always give you the same solution as the other method. Yeah. So a Pareto front is, the definition of the Pareto front is you can't improve one objective function without making the other objective function worse, That's right? right. Mm -hmm. So if we take a, if we've got that linear combination and if we were to say, okay, I want to bring the linear combination down lower. Um, I'm trying to think because gamma is a fixed parameter If one of those, if one of those gets better, then either your combined objective function gets lower, and so the minimizer would find would find that spot, or your combined objective function would stay the same, but the other one would have to get worse in order to do that. It might be more simple to work this out in 2D or in 1D. Um, you know, in what case, so basically what we're doing here with this uh, linear combination is, uh, um, let's say that, uh, just a second, let me get this whiteboard running again. Okay, so so basically we've got um, two functions here. Let's say that that one function looks like this, and the other function looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're um, So what we're doing is uh, creating a third function that's a combination of the two. If I, um, so, so if, so I'll do a family of functions here. So basically if I take just a, if I take mostly blue and a little bit of pink, then, um, then it will, it will look um, let's see it's still got to be above and then it'll cross like right there something like that right so that would be one linear combination mm -hmm. So anyway, we'd have to think about the family of combinations here and whether whether that's, that result gives you something different than um, than constraining one to some value and solving for the other. Yeah, I don't know. We'd have to think about it. I don't know off the top of my head the pros and cons to each of these. So mm -hmm. I do yeah. think the constrained optimization can take more calls, you know, I would, I would imagine. Um, so from a speed point, if these are identical, I can see that there might be some benefits to this linear combination method. I would, yeah. I would imagine, you know, but. Uh, I would, I would think so too. Well, now, now that I think about it as well, I think they, I think they probably are the same. It's just kind of, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. 
I think you're probably right there the same. Okay, um, does anyone else on the call have an example they want to look at, a Pareto front they've built? I haven't completed mine yet, so. Okay, Ben is almost there. Nolan, how about you? Um, I don't have the Pareto front, but I do have some results that are comparing the two. But I'll, I'll keep working on the Pareto front. Okay. So I guess while we're waiting, it might also be interesting to look at uh, this X and Y combination, how that changes. Dr. Hunsaker. Mm -hmm. So with the Pareto front, you were just grabbing the last, like the optimized value for both of those. Or for, for whatever condition you're running, you're running the, the optimized value in the um, optics text folder. Or sorry, the optimization.txt file. Um, well, what I was no, I didn't. I didn't use that. I was using SciPy, so oh, it didn't. Yeah. It didn't create a, a file for me. So I was just printing out every single call here. Um, I was printing out the gamma, you know, my mixing mm -hmm. amount, the actual x and y values, the drag, the noise, and then the result. The result is a mix, you know, between the two. So it was optimizing on result, and I've modified this to look at that other thing but it was optimizing on you know that total result but i wanted to know what the drag and the noise were and then what i do is at the end of that uh after it finished uh so it was it was printing this out for every single call but i just took the very last solution which told me gamma you know i was out putting gamma right there yeah. to the screen and then all that information gotcha. and then my plotting was drag versus noise yeah so okay Okay. Okay, let me know when you're you got something, Ben, you got something? Yeah, I do. Let me share my screen. Okay. It's really, this is an, so I did the, the Himmelblau, which was the, um, the one I had before with the four minimums. Mm -hmm. And then I added on top of it, the holder table, which has four minimums as well. And, um, Turns out that's not a great idea to, <laughs> to hand an optimizer. So I started at gamma zero and it could not figure out gamma zero no matter. Well, I, I changed the, the initial guess three or four times and it had a really hard time. So gamma zero means it's going purely based off of the holder table function, which was the the this guy right here. Um, but anywho, um, what so solver? this is my... I I was using optics, just the BFGS one that we were initially using. Okay. Um, so one of the points, this guy right here, gamma point two, seems to be kind of an outlier, and I don't know what's going on there, but then you can kind of see if I got rid of that guy, I think it'd be a little bit more obvious. The the curve is a little bit easier to see in there. Um, okay yeah i also thought it was interesting that uh since i'm i have these two functions that both have several optimums um most of the time it stays around this x equals three y equals two ish point but at gamma point two which is maybe that's why it's 
that's probably now that I think about it, that's probably why it's such an outlier is that it's going to a different optimum, whether it be in the Himmel or the or the holder. Mm-hmm. But anywho. Yep. This is okay. This is um a beautiful example of how challenging optimization can be. Right. So you've chosen <laughs> two two functions that have local minima, multiple local minima. And mm-hmm. you know, solving one of those on its own is is challenging because you can get four different solutions. And in fact, if you go back to the image of what the uh, holder function looks like, I think there's 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 more local minima than that. You you said that there are only four, but there's actually um, what is this? One, two, three, five, six by six. There's within this design space, it looks like, to me like there's thirty six local minima. Mm-hmm. A local minimum is just a place where all of the surrounding uh, values increase, right? So every place that you have a circle on there is is a local minimum. It looks like you have one in every single square, basically, mm-hmm. right? And and we're only looking at it in this 10 by 10, uh, well, I guess it's 20 by 20 region, but it looks like it continues outside of that as well. Um, and so this is a real challenge for any optimization code to solve in and just by itself, right? And now we're going to mix that with another one that has uh, four uh, optimum. And so the where we initialize our solution, all of our solutions here are going to be extremely sensitive to what we've initialized at our initial guess, right? And so um, uh, anyway, yeah. So the the Pareto front that you're showing there just happens to be, you know, I would guess that. A few of those are going to similar solutions, but but possibly even the ones that seem to be giving somewhat the same solutions, I, I would guess are possibly even finding different local minima, you know, within the holder function or within the Himmel function, not within Himmel, Himmel's a, a distance away from there, but within the holder function, it may be bouncing around between some of those squares that we saw. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it. And it makes me wonder if, because I don't have an, a constraint like this on my region, if if there's a whole bunch of, if, if you go outside of it, it just keeps finding even more uh, uh, greater minimization as it, yeah. it finds more pockets. Um, exactly. I don't know how this changes, but yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so the the complexity of the problem increases once we're trying to do multi-objective optimization. You know, if if either one of mm-hmm. the design spaces that we're working in is not well behaved, that that you know convolutes then the the Pareto front between the two. So, mm-hmm. okay, fantastic, uh, Nolan or Kyler. Yeah, I can share mine. Okay, so I did the Goldstein and Booth. Um, the Booth looks like this. Just, just these two right here. Um, okay, can you scroll to the right uh, just a little bit? Yeah. I want to see what the local minima are or where these are. So we're so we're looking for when we're totally Goldstein, then we want a zero minus one. When we're totally Booth, we want a one comma three right yeah okay yeah so i i'm wondering here because um this is how i set it up where i had the goldstein the booth function with the weight and then returned the result Mm -hmm. and then ran scipy with just grabbing the last row of these, the last iteration call, a function call. Um, and then brought them over here for each of the weighting values. Okay, so when weight is one, it should be totally Goldstein. And I'm not sure that that found the right answer. Yeah. See that? Yeah, yeah, I do see that. Because it doesn't, yeah, it looks too large. Well, yeah, the, the X and Y values, I don't remember seeing a minus 0. 0.6 and minus 0. 0.4. It seems like it was like a three and a negative one or something. I can't remember. So let's see. Because this this number looks familiar from what I was doing previously. 
here, like this negative 0.59. Is the same okay, as but can you go back to the online what it says the solution should be? Yeah. Yeah, so here the solution for um, the gold steen should be zero, negative one. Yeah. Okay. So okay. That, that's bothersome to me. See, these are the little things that I'd want to debug as it works through this. So if you go back to your Excel spreadsheet, you're getting the booth function just fine. Right, the one comma three when the weight is zero, mm -hmm. you're getting the correct result there. But the Goldstein function does it, it just something's wrong about how it's solving that. And so I don't yeah. know if it's a typo. Yeah, easily could be a typo. Right, yeah. it's kind of yeah. complicated function there. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, I can look and see if there's the typo in here. In any case, um, this Pareto front is is interesting. You know, whatever that function is, and it really doesn't matter if there's a yeah. typo in there. It it's some kind of a function, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that there's a large jump in the Pareto front. Um, if you zoom in, so on, if you take that x-axis and cut it down to, uh, let's see, maybe fifty, from zero to fifty. From zero to fifty. Uh, yeah, the y axis, let's see, we want to be zero to, um, you know, we can, we can leave that for a second, but let's go to the x axis and go from zero to 50. All right. Okay, and then um, I guess let's do change the y axis from about 100 to 115. Okay, there we go. So we can see somewhat of a Pareto front here, yeah. um, but we can see that it's very sensitive. So basically that between the zero and the point two, if you look up in the data, um, you can see that there's this huge change in the Goldstein and Booth values between yeah. zero and point two, right? Yeah. And, and that was the big jump that we saw down there is, uh, and uh, I've seen that before, you know, where where one function kind of uh, takes over almost like uh, exponentially in importance yeah. or something. And so um, anyway, you you would have to now refine the 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 zero to point two region significantly, where the rest of the region, like we basically understand what that looks like. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But but that jump from zero to point two, there's there's a lot going on there. And so we'd have to run a bunch of cases inside of there to really fill out this Pareto front and see how it transitions. Okay. In that region. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you. Kyler, do you have anything you want to show? Um, I also did the, the booth function with the build function. Um, I don't know if it's and I can share it, but I don't know if there's any additional value to share. Okay, it. let's just see what you got. So Booth and Beal, that's what you. Yeah. We could see it for a second, but now we see your uh, Python code. There you go. Now I can see it. Okay, so you're plotting X and Y on the left plot, and then on the right plot, we've got Booth and Beale. And yours has kind of this similar trait. Um, you know, if everything's running correctly here, that it has large jumps as you get close to gamma of zero and one, and, uh, and then small jumps there from 0.2 to 0.8, it looks to me. I think we might have lost your mic. Are you talking right now, Kyler? Seems to me that you're trying to explain something, but um, yeah, okay, it looks like we lost his mic. Yeah, anyway, um, 
you could play with maybe just real quick. Let's just change the X and Y axes. So the X axis, let's set that from zero to, uh, uh, sorry, on the BLM booth result, not on the X and Y. Yeah, right there. So on the Y axis, let's set that from zero to four. And then on the X axis, let's go from zero to uh, five, maybe. Or no, that's too, well, okay, that kind of worked. Okay, so we can kind of see a little bit of a Pareto front in there. And of course, we'd have to fill out more points um, in order to, to better see what's happening in those big jumps near zero, gamma of zero and one, so. Okay, thanks, Kyler. All right, so that's, uh, I think that was a good discussion on multi-objective optimization. That's that's just one way to approach it. You know, of course, there's a lot more that can, uh, you know, there are books written on this type of stuff. And all I was trying to do is introduce you guys to the topic of, of multi-objective optimization. One way to look at it, Corey pointed out another very valid way to look at it where you constrain one to a certain value and then you, you just optimize on one of the objective functions instead of optimizing on both. And um, uh, anyway, so there are obviously different ways to look at it. And but the the real, I, I think the real meat here is to understand what a Pareto front is, how you can create one, and uh, you know technically what it means, and and that that's a really nice way to visualize a trade off between two different objectives that are are competing. Now, once in a while, you'll run into non competing objectives, which is really nice, where when you when you minimize one, the other one is also minimized, you know, but usually when you get close to the optimum of one objective, you're, you're paying a price in the other objective, you know, so usually there is a trade, a Pareto front, uh, a trade off between those two. Um, so that's a kind of a common thing, I guess, to see in multi-objective optimization.